You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Juliet Spare. British people love to talk about the weather. British people also like to complain about the weather. Too cold, too wet, and now it's too hot. The dominating high pressure has been dominating conversations. Stories about the weather have filled column inches in newspapers and pictures of people sitting in deck chairs in parks are broadcast on news packages. Yes, it's sunny, but so what? It is summer. Well, it had been predicted by experts that the UK would face 10 years of cold, wet summers, which may be one reason why the prolonged heat wave has come as a rather pleasant surprise and a hot topic of conversation. Joining me in the studio to talk about the weather is Professor Ben Armstrong, who's a professor in epidemiological statistics at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Piers Corbyn, who is a long-range weather and climate forecaster. Serena Cowdy, who's a wildlife and animal welfare journalist. And down the line, Professor Michael Tipton, who is a professor of human physiology at the University of Portsmouth at the Extreme Environment Laboratory. First of all, I'm going to start with you, Piers. Why are long-term weather predictions sometimes so wrong? Well, I think, first of all, you should be clear that you're talking about what the Met Office said after their climate summit. They didn't actually say that. What they said was they thought there might be more wet summers. And I think they said that because they've got all the previous ones wrong. Now, in terms of a long-range climate forecast, what we said at Weather Action was we're now in a, uh, what you might call a, well, it's a rapidly or extremely oscillating jet stream type situation that will go on for the next 25 years, which is roughly called a mini ice age. That means the average will often be lower than normal. We'll have cold winters and wet summers. Uh, but it doesn't mean they're all going to be like that. In fact, in previous mini ice ages, there were some warm or very warm summers or certainly summer months, which is one we're in now. And they're caused by big swings in the jet stream. Professor Michael Tipton then at the Extreme Environment Laboratory at Portsmouth. How unusual is this really? It seems that when you look back at when the heat waves occur, um, they're about every three years, 2002 or 2003, 2006, 2009, and here we are again. Um, it's my understanding, although it's not my specialist subject, perhaps peers can confirm it, that with global warming, although the temperature may only go up on average by about four degrees and by about 2070, we will see many more of these swings. I mean, it was only about a month or two ago that our sea temperatures were about three degrees below what we would have expected them to have been, and people were getting dragged out of the water on open swimming events. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing big, we're seeing big swings, which uh, I think is a partly a consequence of the, you know, global warming and, as you've heard, the jet stream. Well, uh, but we haven't got global warming. We've actually got global cooling and uh, fiddled data by the Met Office and the, uh, the United Nations. Um, what we have had is not warming, but cooling on average, and we're at the start of a uh, long cooling. Can you can you expand on that? Because I was going to suggest that this is climate change not necessarily global warming well, this is climate change climate is always changing and we can predict some a lot of aspects of climate change due to changes of solar activity we've got where we are now in a low period of average solar activity and it will get lower last time there was one as low as this was the early uh, uh, 1800s the maunder minimum where you had uh, constables paintings of really angry skies and it was generally cold and there was another one before that, sorry, that was the Dalton minimum. Before that was the Maunder minimum, about, you know, 1650, 7 to 1710 or something. And that was, uh, that was even colder. And again, that was very low solar activity, a period we're in now. Uh, does that feed into the certain British obsession with talking about the weather? Oh, yeah. You've got <laughs> give you plenty to talk about. Um, interestingly, in past times, uh, the, 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 a lot of times in, in history, the experts have said we've, we're in something different. It's, it's only because these changes last more than a lifetime, so people think they're in something fundamentally different when actually everything has basically happened before. There, there are some downsides, which is why I'd like to come to you now, Professor Ben Armstrong. Um, you're from the London School of Tropical Medicine, and you've actually been predicting the number of deaths as a result of hot weather and this particular heat wave. Can you care to expand on that? Well, we've done quite a few epidemiological studies, studies which look at associations between health and various aspects of the environment. 
Uh, and in particular, we've looked at uh, UK deaths, all the deaths in, uh, well, England and Wales strictly, over a 13-year, 14-year period. And over that period, from 93 to 2006, we found there was a very clear pattern that as temperatures rose above a certain threshold, so for London that's 25 degrees, roughly speaking, uh, risk of death increased, numbers of deaths on those days uh, were greater than numbers of deaths in a similar time of year without those temperatures. And we used those models to, pr to make an estimate for the first nine days of this hot period of the number of deaths which would have been brought forward, made premature by uh, this heat wave, which was uh, 650 deaths. Have you been criticised for talking about maybe negative stories alongside <laughs> the weather in, in relation to your research? Uh, <laughs> there's been uh, a great deal of web chat uh, following the, 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 these estimates uh, from a wide range of perspectives. Uh, I think it's, it's, we, we try to make it clear from the work we did, not all of it was published in the, the, the Times article which first uh, presented these figures, but we like to think that we've got most of the ifs and buts and the, and the context in material which is published on the School of Hygiene website. Uh, and in that, for example, we make it very clear that the vast majority of those deaths which would be occurring in excess of the normal pattern in periods of heat would be among the elderly, probably among quite frail people. And so it's entirely possible that a good many of those deaths are deaths that would have occurred in the next uh, a few weeks. So we're not entirely sure how many of those 650 deaths represent substantial life shortening. Nevertheless, it does, uh, I think, uh, do good for us to pause and to think that uh, just because we don't see these deaths, unlike the deaths from, say, drowning and uh, uh, heat exhaustion, the more obvious uh, uh, deaths due to heat, uh, they are nevertheless occurring. I think it's a tremendously, you know, useful research about practical effects of the weather. It's really important. But, Professor Armstrong, uh, could you tell us the effect of very cold weather? I mean, is it correct that that kills more people when it's very cold than, uh, um, than very hot? I mean, they're both a problem, but on average in winters, more of a die of hypothermia if they're very cold winters, don't they? In the United Kingdom, that's certainly true. It's yeah. much more people due to uh, die in relation to cold than to heat. Of course, mm. every, every country, every climate has a different sure. uh, pattern in this respect. So if you were to go, for example, to, to Delhi, where we did some studies, the, the opposite would be the case. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yes, in the United Kingdom, uh, the cold kills more people than heat. I do want to uh, introduce Serena Cowdy to the discussion. You're a wildlife and animal welfare journalist. So moving on from the perhaps more negative stories that we've seen or read about, in relation to this heat wave, what effect is it having on the environment? So I think we need to establish first that obviously the effect on wildlife really does dis depend on this specific species of wildlife we're talking about. So it's not negative on, on all wildlife. For example, insects really suffered in the cold, wet spring we just had. And now this heat wave is actually bringing out butterflies and moths. And that's actually, we're seeing loads of those and we didn't see any in, you know, in the last month or so. Um, but other species are really suffering and actually it's, I need to give a bit of a call to arms. Anyone who's got a garden, anyone who's got any balcony, you've got to put water out because any animals that need to dig into the soil to find their food, black, for example, blackbirds, hedgehogs, they're really struggling because the soil has become so hard and dry that the worms have gone far deeper into the soil and actually it's very difficult for them to get the food, it's very difficult for them to find water. And, um, and also other animals, all the birds, you know, they, we need to put water out for them to bathe in. And so there's, there's lots that people can actively do really easily now to kind of uh, mitigate the effects of the heat wave. There have been even wildfires in East London. This is going to have a long-term effect, is it not, on the environment? That's right. Actually, grass fires are quite an interesting phenomenon because they're not necessarily negative. Uh, people in other countries, in Mediterranean countries, do set fires um, deliberately to clear brush and clear heath at certain times of year and that's actually a ecological management strategy that's used. The problem in London is that these aren't obviously being set deliberately and they're not being managed and what's happening is people are dropping cigarettes and possibly deciding to have barbecues which is in these areas is a really bad idea and so the fires are burning out of control and the way that they're, they're burning means that they're burning very quickly which means that reptiles and certain mammals and birds just can't get out of the way quick enough 
and that's why we're seeing the fire brigades really dealing with it as quickly as possible. To return to you, uh, Piers Corbyn, mm. you mentioned that the statistics surrounding global warming or climate change were perhaps not correct. Um, if you study closely what the University of East Anglia Climate Research Unit puts out and along with them the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for the United Nations, um, they choose data sets every year since 2009 or more or less every year. They've chosen a slightly different data set and said that is a standard data set. Now, each data set is real data, but they've chosen them so that the um, past uh, gets uh, looks colder and the present gets warmer. And if you compare, say, the 2001 data sets with the ones now, then you can see actually the difference in rise is uh, about half a degree. In other words, they fiddle the data by about half a degree. Now, I'm not the only one saying this. This is from a, a study that others produced, and I've looked at it, and that's my conclusion. And I saw a paper circulated only this morning which says the fiddle factor is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4. So probably not as much as the 0.5 that I, I'm reckoning, but that was a rough estimate. But why would this fiddle factor have an effect on forecasting and... Will it have an effect on the way that we view the climate change? Well, it will have an effect change. on forecasting because if you ask the Met Office what data do they use to test their models for forward predicting some aspects of climate, they say, oh, the University of East Anglia data. Well, all that stuff has exaggerated temperatures, so it's not surprising that all their forecasts for the last five years of, uh, of winter have been too mild and summer have been too warm as well. But this is having a positive effect in that what you said, Serena, about the butterflies and moths all appearing and they were a bit delayed in May with the cold, wet about weather. A month, was it a month's delay? That's I thought, right. I thought the impression I got. Yeah, that's mm. about right. Basic we did a forecast for the um, the the, uh, the growers of, of um, uh, asparagus and said that the asparagus season, where you can buy the stuff in the shops, would be about four or five weeks late. And that's, yeah. in fact, what happened, which is the same as the lateness of butterflies. That's actually. right. Actually, a really interesting species, which is, is a good example here, is the stag beetle, because um, their larvae live in, in dead wood, rotten wood. And the larvae actually take six years living in this wood as larvae before they turn into adults. And the adults wow. only live for six or seven weeks. So basically, if they miss that window and, um, you know, spring was so cold and late, the stag beetles came out a lot mm. later. And then obviously they're coming out later and then they're looking for food sources. And the food sources that are growing later in the year are going to be different from those that are around in May or June. So these kind of... Unless uh, they're all laid together. In case, yeah, unless they're all laid together. But if, if, the, if the beetles are coming out when, for example, certain sources, plants aren't flowering right. or, you know, mm. nectar-giving plants are not flowering anymore. Because some then plants would give up and wouldn't turn up at all, of course, and so on. What's that? Well, well, there might be some plants that would have happened, but the plants themselves gave up, so the yes. beetles would come out and they're not there. Exactly, yeah, okay. exactly. And also, what's really interesting is, as well as this particular heat wave um, affecting wildlife, you can see climate change... Um, there are, there are effects of climate change that we're beginning to see on the migratory patterns of birds over the longer term. So birds, for example, that some species of duck that were previously moving from Scandinavia to us here in, in, in the UK um, to look for warmer climates are now actually have been found not to bother because it's actually getting a little bit warmer in Scandinavia. I don't know, Piers, whether you'd back that well, assertion the, up. The thing that's is, the there's, there's lots of... You can always find some measurement which looks like it agrees with you, but the thing yeah. is, taken as a whole, yeah. the world has actually been cooling in the last... Now, some bits of Scandinavia might be warmer. I, I don't know. So yeah. all sorts of things will happen. But... The problem with the warmest is they just look for examples that prove their case, when what you've got to do is look at the whole picture. And also, bear in mind, is average temperature that important? Because really what counts is what happens in, any, in a country or a region in any particular year. Like, we're hot now because of the high pressure, but it's been cold in Finland. So are they going to say it's global cooling in Finland? I don't know, they might do, but that's a silly view, isn't it? You've got to look at the whole picture. Well, uh, well... Why don't I ask you, uh, Professor Michael Tipton, you're from the Extreme Environment Laboratory, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I think there's, there's been an ongoing debate about the, uh, you know, whether the climate is warming or not for, for some years now. From our point of view, what we're most interested in is the impact uh, of the environment on you know, otherwise fit and healthy individuals. And we've already heard that there's an excess death, a number of deaths mm -hmm. in the 
in the summer, and there's about 10 times, up towards 10 times more excess deaths in the winter. Um, and quite rightly, as, as mentioned, you know, that, those deaths are in this sort of age group of 75 plus. And one of the things that's quite interesting about the, the climate, and actually it's kind of reflected in what we've been talking about thus far, we're very obsessed with the weather, we're less obsessed with the consequences of the weather in terms of the number of deaths we get from you know, periods of heat, periods of cold, the number of drowning deaths we see in this country each year. It almost goes unnoticed. And yet many of those deaths would be quite easy to prevent or reduce. So, for example, in both the heat and the cold, the mechanism of death isn't the direct effect of heat, it's not hyperthermia or in the cold hypothermia. Those deaths are actually caused by a reduction in the amount of circulating fluid we have, blood volume, which in susceptible individuals leads to cardiac problems. So we see cardiac problems in the winter um, caused by the responses to cold, the body shutting down and losing a lot of fluid um, by producing urine. And in the, w in the summer, we see the same kind of mechanism, um, but caused by excess sweating and a move towards dehydration. So uh, what, what advice do you have then for, for people dealing with the consequences of the extreme weather and to prevent deaths? Number one with the elderly is to ensure that there's a proper level of hydration and a minimum exposure to these swings of hot and cold. With the general population, it's really a lot of common sense. It's making sure that you don't engage in excessive activity when we're in you know, 34, 33 degrees Celsius as we are today because the body, that steps outside the body's ability to thermoregulate and you will have an increase in core temperature or deep body temperature which starts at 37. When it gets to 41, you're you know, entering heat stroke, which is a life-threatening condition. And, and this is what um, Professor Armstrong has mm. been forecasting. Yes, I'm glad you had Mike on the, on the programme because I think our ex expertise complement each other well in that uh, I am a statistician. I, I, I don't know the, the physiology of how heat or cold, uh, the various pathways by which it can affect health other than secondhand through my medical colleagues. But uh, what he said squares very much with w what I've heard from other medical colleagues. And it fills in uh, some of what we can't see from the statistics. We can count that there are uh, an excess, say, 650 deaths, but we uh, we can't tell simply by, for example, looking at the med at the at the death certificates, uh, <coughs> quite what the mechanism was that precipitated their death. There, uh, from the cause of death, it's a very wide range of causes of death. It's heart disease, it's respiratory disease, and right through cancer and so on. So it's very likely to be people with underlying disease for which the heat has precipitated death. Perhaps if we were more obsessed with the consequences of, of weather, then people might open their eyes more to the fact that there is a change in the climate. Well, and actually, yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and many of the things that we can do to make our own lives easier, especially people, for example, living in big cities, um, also will make the wildlife in those cities' lives easier as well. So, for example, there's this sort of phenomenon of urban heat islands and the fact that it's particularly warm in cities and a lot of that uh, is not helped by the uh, impermeable drainage we've got. We don't have, in cities, we don't have enough um, natural per permeable drainage uh, ground which means that the water can circulate and we don't have enough trees and the more trees we have we'll be able to hold on to the water that's circulating in those urban systems and that will obviously provide shade for us and it will also keep the water rather than evaporating off and making it even drier in those environments will actually help recycle it. As somebody who works in the media do you feel that your message uh, is picked up and you are able to get it across about how important it is that wildlife needs to stay in the news agenda? I think there are different levels. I think the message is being picked up about the need to put water in your gardens. You know, in the short term, people love feeding the birds, people enjoy watching them in their gardens. So for individual species and individual birds, you know, people are keen to help them. I think what's less uh, picked up and what, need, what needs greater prominence is the fact that on an infrastructural level, we need to be helping the wildlife and in that way it will also be helping ourselves so the way we build our buildings the way we create habitat the way we need to have wildlife gardens as well as lovely landscape gardens outside um, and I think more needs to be done 
to educate the public about the wider effects of climate change on wildlife in this country? Well, I, I agree yes. with all that, except it's not effects of climate change. But I think one, one thing we have to look at is the effects of climate change policy, because as it is, uh, a thousand birds a day are killed in, in Britain and Europe by wind farms and another thousand birds a day are killed by, by in America. Now, this is a consequence of so-called saving the planet, which is complete nonsense and they should all be uh, removed, I, I, I would say. That is certainly a controversial <laughs> issue and one that... Well, my, they're, one they're stupid, I'm... dangerous, ugly and expensive and the electricity that comes from them costs three times what it costs from uh, normal methods. But I wanted to bring up another effect of... important effect of weather and extreme events and, and climate change, which is a natural process, um, what we think is there will be more extreme contrasts in the coming 25 years, mostly cold spells, but not all. Some of them will be very hot spells. There will certainly be more hailstorms, and that causes damage. Uh, there will be um, uh, more storms in general, more intense storms. Now, all of those things have a bad effect on agriculture. And last summer, the effect on British and European agriculture was atrocious. I mean, you know, the, the quality of wheat and barley was really, really poor. And if we have a lot of summers like that, uh, then food prices will go up worldwide and the consequence of that will be millions of deaths right not just a few thousand due to due to heat i mean food prices and energy prices are the key thing which ought to be addressed in the coming years because they're going to be forced up by this naturally changing climate and the problem with the global warmers policies are they're pointing the world in the wrong direction they're saying we're going into warmer climate which is not true and all their predictions have actually failed so we should ignore what they say and prepare for wide extremes in a generally colder climate and more food production problems basically these extremes are bad for agricultural production i'd just throw in there that actually um i agree that there's a huge amount of pressure on farmers at the moment and mm. a lot of that is due to the huge swings in the seasons um but what I think really needs to be focused on and what isn't focused on enough is the fact that wildlife and farming can work together and mm. actually help farmers in a way that they're not fully acknowledging or fully realising at the moment. And a classic example is because the farmers are feeling mm. under Absolutely. so much pressure, the government's obviously um, had this slightly controversial issue of the bees and the neonicotinoid pesticides. And um, they've, they've sort of sat on the fence and they don't want to ban them because they think basically, you know, they'll, uh, they'll alienate the farmers. But actually bees and other pollinating insects, which are often ignored, hoverflies, flies, um, beetles of various kinds, are huge crop pollinators. So if we don't treat them correctly and we do um, just go to pesticides as a short-term solution in the long run farming and productivity is really going to suffer. I agree with that completely. A lot of farmers I know do agree with you but of course <laughs> you know uh, it's what really happens on the big farms is yeah. what counts and yeah. you, have to, you have to get to grips with that and most farmers are very conscious of what you say but there's a need for more education professor ben armstrong <laughs> the the issue of oscillating climate uh, the potential uh, a potentially more oscillating climate be it from uh, the natural cycles that piers was talking about or uh, change due to anthropogenic emissions, such as other climate scientists predict, is an issue for health, human health also. Humans, as I suspect, like other species, are quite good at adapting to what they know and what they're used to. So if, for example, you look at uh, the response to the sort of temperatures we've had in the last couple of weeks in somewhere like Dallas, Texas, you'll find nobody dying uh, because they're well used to those uh, temperatures. So what is difficult for uh, uh, societies is to cope with something they're not used to. Now, we don't know what the sort of ad adaptation cycle might be, but we're pretty sure it's more than the, the few years that you might get, or even 10 or 20 years, uh, as some sort of either natural or anthropogenic climate change might kick in. But the really interesting aspects for me are uh, not so much that people die when it gets unusually hot or unusually cold for that society, but what aspects of behaviour or the way we build our buildings or the way we cope, uh, manage our wildlife, how do they change our vulnerability to those cold or hot temperatures? I mean, can I come in, just come in there Certainly, and, support Professor what, Tipton. Um, and just support what Professor Armstrong is saying? Because on the other side of the coin, you're talking about societies that are used to 
um, the conditions. Yeah. And for example, we see more cold injuries, frostbite and non-freezing cold injuries in southern European states than we do in um, Scandinavia, simply mm. because the Scandinavians have learnt the correct behaviour. And it really is all about behaviour because we are tropical animals. We are evolved in an environment that was 26 to 28 degrees air temperature with no clothing. And really the only thing that has enabled us to inhabit the rest of the planet has been our ability to learn how to cope with the varying um, environments as we move away from those equatorial origins with clothing, with fires, with heating, etc., etc. And so really what you're talking about is an extension of that um, evolutionary trend for groups to move to different parts of the globe and learn how, learn how to live there. Of course, what's happening now is we're seeing people staying where they are, but the temperature's changing. So they need to learn that those skills without actually moving and that comes down to you know, an educational process uh, and it comes down to understanding the risks and how to mitigate them. So by that token it seems that you'll be very busy Professor Armstrong <laughs> with your research. Well I hope people are, are, are well focused on improving uh, our ability to uh, cope with cold and hot weather whether cold and hot weather becomes more likely or not. Uh, because it does kill a lot of people, advance their deaths, and it's avoidable. Serena, is there anything you'd like to add, a final forecast to, to this hot weather topic? Yeah, I'd like to say, uh, on the, in the short term, obviously, we all need to keep doing what we're doing and keep putting the water out of the birds and the animals. But in the long term also, I think if you have a little bit of wild habitat that you can manage, like your garden, for example, exactly as we were saying earlier, we need to start planting for the future. We need to start planting plants that are good for wildlife and are also capable of dealing with hot, dry spells and cold, cold extreme spells. So if you, if you look around for plants like that, next year your garden will be more of a haven for wildlife. Professor Ben Armstrong, final, final forecast, final word from you. In hot weather, there is a danger of people dying, in particular the elderly and frail. If you have some relatives or neighbours who fall into that category, make sure they are drinking plenty. And I'll leave perhaps Mike to add other ideas. Mike, over to you. OK, I mean, just for people to recognise, um, really a comment and then a question, uh, for people to recognise there are these hidden epidemics of drowning across the globe, 1.2 um, you know, million people drowning. There are deaths related to heat, deaths related to cold. And we need to appreciate that before we start doing anything um, positive about reducing that number. So it's really moving from a state of um, ignorance to a state of awareness. My comment and question for you know, whoever's out there is, do we think we will ever get to a situation where we will have to reorganize the planet to have humans living where they can live, crops growing where they can grow, they can grow, and you know animals living and breeding where they can live and breed. I'd really like to thank all my guests for joining me on the Voice of Russia: Piers Corbin, long-range yeah. weather and climate forecaster; Serena Cowdy, wildlife and animal welfare journalist; Professor Michael Tipton, who's a professor of human physiology at the University of Portsmouth, and Professor Ben Armstrong from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine.